Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm Crow of Murder 15. And I'm DX Kramer. So, this episode is going to be a little more free laced. I actually don't have a script written for this one. So, this is going to be a little bit out of the ordinary. So, what we're wanting to do with this second part is for myself and DX Kramer to sit down and talk about our different styles of DMing because there are so many different ways that you can do it. And some people prefer one method, some prefer another, and there's no wrong way of doing it. There's just a bunch of different methods. That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ain't that the truth. So what I wanted to do is I wanted, because Paul and I have both uh, DM'd before. And granted, yes, he's had more experience than I have, but I wanted him to kind of go about how he does DMing compared to my own and show that one's not better than the other one's not wrong one's not right these are just different styles and maybe give people more of an experience and explanation of how there's different ways you can dm mm -hmm. so paul uh how how do you uh, go about dming well i tend to use what is more what is more referred to as a theater of the mind uh kind of way of dming um, when I first started playing D and D back in nineteen, remember inserted here. Um, <laughs> we there were a, like there were a lot of us. Like I don't know how my DM did it, but she had like eleven players. Wow. Uh, yeah. So when you have eleven people with character sheets and pencils, and dice, and all that stuff, there's really no room for minis or a map. Right, so. and, and this is also before, you know, and I'm not trying to call you old or anything, but this is also before, you know, apps and such like D&D &D Beyond and tablets and electronic uh, ways of keeping track of your character were around. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, is, that is very true, and yes, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> so, we, we, I tend to use more of a style where... It helps too that I don't use a lot of combat. I do, I do have combats. You can attest to this, but mm -hmm. they tend to go like to the back burner compared to just like role play. Right. Um. Yeah. So, so I, I like you. I like letting people envision it in their minds a little more than having. Okay, here's the tavern. Here's all the tables and chairs. There's thirty orcs in the door. What do? <laughs> That's fair. Um, I kind of have something a little bit similar to that, but it only comes up whenever... Because uh, where we live in an age where you can literally play Dungeons & Dragons with your friends online over Discord with things like D&D &D Beyond and uh, Roll20 and stuff like that, it's easy to be... Well, I wouldn't necessarily say easy, but it's a little more convenient to try to get a game set up with people over the internet rather than everybody sitting down, which, honestly, I prefer, you know, everybody sitting down around the table, rolling actual dice and that kind of stuff. But the main thing that I try to do whenever I DM is kind of have a good blend of storytelling, theater of the mind, like you said, but make sure there's visual representation whenever there's a combat scenario going on. And the main reason that I do that personally is because um, sometimes and I've noticed this with your games and other people's games, sometimes players can kind of get confused of where things are at in comparison yeah. to how close is this enemy? You know, how far away is this item that I can reach for? Yeah, which is fair, but let's face it, minis are expensive. Yeah, they, I will admit to that, yeah. As, especially in, I'm, um, you know, kind of calling myself out here, especially when you buy your own custom ones from Hero Forge. Well, e even if you buy, like, a four-pack or however many come in, like, the D&D &D minis, the official D&D &D minis or Pathfinder minis or whatever, you know, you're spending... Twelve, fifteen dollars on a box of four minis, and you may not even get what you need. Exactly. So, it's not necessary to get all of these different miniatures and maps and that kind of stuff. Now, as I've said in the previous episode, a good if for people that are just starting to DM, I highly recommend getting a uh, a module. Um, and there there's tons of them. Even if you don't buy one, there's tons of different formats that you can find online. Um, even if they're not the official ones from Wizards of the Coast or Dungeons and Dragons 
because um, a lot of people have sat down, written one shots of campaigns, multitudes of like campaigns that could last three, four years or so that are to an extent extremely balanced. <laughs> But, yeah, emphasis on to an extent. Yeah. Now, whenever you start becoming a little more experienced, like Paul is, is when I would recommend start doing home brewing. And I've dabbled in it a little bit, but not to the point of I would be able to write out a whole entire campaign purely based on homebrew alone. There's, I have, I have honestly personally taken inspiration from a lot of things, books, video games. I actually once based an entire part of a campaign on Law and Order. I'm dead serious. That's actually really interesting. It was very difficult to do, but I did it. Um, as far as my home brewing, uh, a good example was there was a campaign that I was running when I was first DMing, and I was actually running the module that's like your beginner set for uh, D&D 5e, um, the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, and one of my players came up to me uh, during, or like one of the, uh, one of my players was like, hey Seth, does there happen to be a enchanter in town? And in the manual, in the instruction book, well, I wouldn't even say that, in the module, there was no mention of Enchanter. So, you know, most people that are trying to stick strictly to the book are like, no. And there are DMs that do that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, in my own personal opinion, never feel like you have to stick strictly to the book. In my experience, I told him, yes, there is. And I literally created a brand new character that had nothing to do with the original story or the original module, came up with a background for them, uh, came up with a voice for them, came up with a design for them and everything, like just right there on the spot. So that's something also that I feel like makes a really good DM is good improv skills. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a skill that requires a lot of practice too. Yeah, because... <laughs> You gotta be prepared for literally anything. Yeah, and in all, in all honesty, you won't be. You will not be prepared for everything. Because sometimes your players will want to stick strictly to the script like you had intended and go. Or they could go off far and left field and you're like, where the hell are you people going? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing over there. I haven't created that part of the map yet. <laughs> Well, you better start creating it now. <laughs> right, exactly. So, Crack um, the whip. <laughs> but yeah, um, this is just kind of a general overguide of different styles of DMing and such, and we just wanted to kind of give you uh, an idea of, their, of different ways of going about DMing. Um, this is just mine and Paul's personal ways we DM. Um, there's plenty of other examples. I mean, you have shows such as Critical Role with Matt Mercer, the way he DMs. There's uh, XP to level 3, the way he DMs. So there's a lot of different styles, and the best advice that I could give is find a style that not only fits you, but something that your players want to interact with as well. Uh, if, if I may... May, if I may make an addendum to that, also make sure that you talk to your players about their comfort zones. Right. Because uh, I have I have seen more than one game just completely uh, disband because the players were expecting, we'll say, PG level stuff, and the DM was totally going making rated R look very uh look look off into the uh sunset. <laughs> yeah, um that's that's another really good key factor is make sure to talk to your players. Talk to your players before the game, during the game, and after the game and in between sessions. Um it's good to in, in my personal experience it's good to hear your players out. As far as, and that's my girlfriend messaging me over and over and over again. <laughs> so if you hear dings throughout this episode, I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> Told you this was unscripted. 
Um, <laughs> but it, it's good to communicate with your players on on three aspects. It's what did you enjoy, what did you not enjoy, and what is there anything you want to change. Um, now, don't necessarily take everything that your players to heart, but at least keep it in consideration. And the best way I can describe it is kind of come to a compromise. Um, I'll give a really good example. There's a campaign or a one shot that I'm planning on doing in the near future, which hopefully have happened by the time this episode airs, um, where one of my players is going to be a ranger, but instead of normally with a ranger and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Paul, uh, normally with a ranger, if you have the annual animal companion perk, um, normally you just get different animals as you level up. Is that right? Oh, shoot. Um, if I recall correctly, it's not so much... I don't think it's so much... I, I need to relook at the ranger class, but uh, I think it's more... They, they get stronger as you level up. I think you get more options. Okay. But you don't necessarily have to change it. Right, okay. Because one, uh, one of my players said, uh, I want to play a ranger that has an animal companion, but I want to make it an owlbear, and I want this owlbear to follow me throughout my entire travel. And I'm like, okay, I can arrange for that, probably. Because what I like to do is, like, give... If it's nothing... If it's something that's not too ludicrous and you could kind of work around, such as having a ranger that has a owlbear instead of a general animal companion that they can get, uh, then I say go for it. Because I feel like... Unless it's an extremely ludicrous idea, like, oh, I don't know, making a, a, a bronze dragonborn mate with people so that way it could have babies and produce electricity for a town or something. Um, Wasn't my idea. Oh, I know. <laughs> not speaking from personal experience or anything. But anyway, um, if it's not <laughs> too far out there, you know, work with your player. Try to figure out ways to make that Albel. Uh, the Albel. <laughs> It's an owlbear with, like, a bell for a head. I've created a new creature. There, make, make a chart for that, Matt Mercer. <laughs> Don't tempt him. Oh, I know he would. That's the brilliant thing. But, you know, work with your players. Try to find out ways that you can homebrew an owlbear. Because, what is it? Like, level three, you don't get until you get the animal companion, right? Something like that. Yeah, so, like, tell your player. It's like, yeah, you can have the owlbear as, like, you know, maybe a little cub. Um, for level one and two through your campaign, it just can't do shit. <laughs> no. So, things like that. But anyway, guys, uh, I know this is, was an extremely long episode of Nat One, but we wanted to kind of wrap everything up for what I like to call the f bit, the essentials for Nat One, because next time, whenever we come back to this series, we are going to be going over the different races and classes as far as basic D&D 5e goes. And Heaven forbid if we actually got into splat books. Oh, forget that. I'm only doing basic. There's too many to go over. I mean, okay, if you really want a short guide of what every single race is, down in the description below, I suggest you go check out uh, Joe Cat's video on all the different races. But we'll be going over the basic races for D&D 5e, and we'll be going over all the classes for D&D 5e, and that does include Artificer. Um, which I thought I would never do, because when I was first starting this series, Artificer wasn't even thought of yet. Yeah. So, um, until then, guys, uh, we thank you very, very much for your continuing support uh, watching the tutorials. We hope that it has taught you or refreshed you on Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, and maybe if you weren't interested before in playing, maybe now you want to try to get a game going. Also, we are going to be having a lot more guest stars for the next few episodes, so that's exciting. Ooh! So, I'm excited. Uh, um, so, Paul, I, have, I do have to ask, uh, you're calling dibs on the wizard episode, right? I don't know, I was going to say bard. Bard? Okay. <laughs> that that actually bard. threw me off guard. <laughs> <laughs> all right well guys until then we hope that all of your adventuring goes well your dungeon mastering goes well and next time we'll get into some little deeper 
parts of Dungeons & Dragons with races and classes and how you can start getting into building your characters. Until then, guys, we'll see you next time. Peace.